Hey there, and welcome to another episode of Code Hour. My name is Lee Richardson, and in this episode, I'm going to give an overview of a web framework that you've probably never heard of before. It's called ASP.NET Boilerplate. This framework allows you to get up to speed super fast on projects that are based on ASP.NET. You can have multiple different front ends, but regardless, you're going to get up to speed super fast, and it's going to pre-implement a whole bunch of best practices. I'm going to jump right into a PowerPoint presentation. This is a presentation that I gave at a recent code camp and I'm giving it uh, again to a YouTube audience. Okay, the project is open source and it's free and it's available on GitHub. It's got a number of different stars. It's got a lot of different contributors including yours truly. And this is what the basic template looks like. And you might not be super impressed with this because it's not all that impressive, but think of it instead as sort of a, a blank canvas, something that you can put your own uh, look and feel on. This is a project that I implemented. I've implemented it on two projects now, and you can see it, looks, it can look pretty nice without too much effort. I've implemented it on two projects, and in both cases, the customer has been blown away. Within a week we've been able to give a presentation and the customer has been like, wow, I cannot believe that you accomplished so much in such a short period of time. There's only one reasonable response to that, right? I mean, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty awesome, right? You could, you could say I'm standing on the shoulders of giants or you could, you know, not let the customer know. So this is a great framework. Some of the benefits, just to go over the, the overview of the benefits before we get into the features. It lets you get up to speed super fast, pre-implements a whole bunch of best practices, it gives you authorization and authentication, and there it's extremely well documented. The documentation's great. And uh, like I said, it's free and open source. And here's one little subtle benefit that you may miss, and that is if you or your organization adopts ASP.NET boilerplate, then then you have the benefit of being able to swap in developers in and out of various projects much more easily because everything is kind of based on some of the same best practices. So that's a subtle benefit that's that's nice. Okay, I could go through the slides at this point or let's just do it. I'm gonna go off to their website here and I'm gonna search for ASP.NET Boilerplate. And conveniently enough, the very first button is a get started. And if you click that, it's going to take you right into the startup template wizard. This is a place where you're going to choose some, make some very important decisions. These are decisions which you do not get to redo or undo or change lightly. And I've made this mistake myself on one of my projects. I chose, I mean, first of all, your first choice is ASP.NET Core 2X or ASP.NET MVC 5. Unless you've got a really compelling reason for legacy reasons, you pretty much want to choose ASP.NET Core 2.x because the performance is so much better. Beyond that, the more difficult decision is which target framework you want. And, and like I said, I made the wrong decision on one of my projects. I chose .NET Core, and .NET Core is fantastic. It's new, and it's cross-platform, and it allows you to deploy to Docker, and those are all wonderful things but it also has some disadvantages and it's worth researching this a little bit before you jump right to the .NET Core option. One of those limitations is the query performance is not nearly as good with Entity Framework Core because it's just not as mature of an ORM framework. Another disadvantage of choosing .NET Core is that it doesn't support encryption in the database and it probably doesn't have plans to anytime soon. And beyond that, I, there's other little, oh, the inheritance type. You can't choose table per hierarchy inheritance. Whatever, that's not as big of a deal. So if those kinds of things don't matter to you, then definitely choose .NET Core because cross-platform and running on Docker is great. Your final choice is what front end you want. And this is an amazing set of options that you have. I have the most experience with Angular, but there's a Vue and a React template as well. Uh, you can also choose the multi-page web application, which is not going to give you a spa, but it's going to just give you, you know, uh, ASP.NET with the uh, uh, razor syntax, the squiggles. Um, so I'm going to choose Angular because that's what I'm most familiar with. I'm going to include the login, register, user role, and tenant management pages. Now, 
You can choose to remove this if you want, but I think this is one of the big benefits of it. I'm definitely going to choose it. I do not choose one solution because I like to have Visual Studio open for all my back-end work and have Visual Studio Code open for all of my front-end work. That's yeah, so just up to you. And I'm going to call this Lee's, Lee's Web Store. Okay, and now I'm sure I've got my CAPTCHA right. Uh, the last time I didn't get that. It's too complicated for me. All right, so what this is doing now is it's downloading a zip file of all of the project files that you need to get started with a back end and a Angular front end. And if you click the read the documentation, there's a very nice set of, this jumps you right into all of the documentation, and there's a whole bunch of steps, including double checking your connection string settings and your database and stuff like that. I'm going to walk you through all this instead of going through the documentation. Okay, and I'm back, and now I have extracted everything that was downloaded to my downloads directory, and I extracted it to C Dev Lee's web store, and there's a version number, and then this is where the project begins. So I'll just give a quick folder overview because you know that's that's important. Uh, there's an Angular folder, and if this was a React or a Vue template that I'd chosen for my front end, then this would obviously be, not be called Angular, it would be called whatever it is. And I've double checked, they, they do work, React does work anyway. And then there's an ASP.NET Core. So for the back end world, we've got a Docker folder, which is very light, it's just got a, uh, it's got a couple Docker files. We have a test folder, which is where all of our tests are going to live. And I'm gonna go into a lot more detail on that later. There's a build directory, which is where it's going to, uh, when you do a final build, it's going to put all of its contents and then everything else lives in SIRS. There are one, two, three, four, five, six different projects inside of SIRS, and I'm going to go over those in a little bit of detail. Uh, let's go over it now. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio. I have Visual Studio 2019, but I'm just going to open this up in what I have open already. And I'm going to go into ASP.NET Core and, oops, no, no, I'm not even going to go to Source. I'm going to go to Lee's Web Store Solution. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to need a database to put this into. So I'm going to open up SQL Server Management Studio so that I can create a database in there. Okay, okay, I'm back. And I've opened up the project inside of Visual Studio, I've opened up SQL Server Management Studio, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of all of the projects that exist, like I mentioned, there's a unit tests, sorry, well, they're integration tests, really. They're called unit tests. There's the most important project, which is, well, it's the startup project anyway, the .web.host project, and that is where all of your controllers and your startup.cs lives. That's where everything begins its life from there. So that's the startup project. From there, it calls into the application project, which is where you have all of the uh, the application services. And these application services, you can think of them like controllers. So there's a permissions thing called a role, and this app service gives you, it's an endpoint, it's an API endpoint for JSON that includes uh, things like slash roles slash create slash uh, roles slash get roles async. It gets a whole bunch of, of endpoints on there. And so these essentially become like what you would expect controllers to be in a regular MVC world, except ASP.NET uh, boilerplate gives you a whole bunch of other things to hang off of this, including their own security model and their own repository pattern to be able to get into the database and they give you logging and mapping from object to object and uh, dependency injection and, and a bunch of other things. Okay, so this is sort of like the main entry point. This is a very important project. From there, all of the main code in your project lives in core and so you should think of core as the place where you're trying to put as much logic as possible. You put all your services and all of the domain logic for your application. So I think of application as the, the lightweight get in and get out as quickly as possible and core is the place where all the logic lives. There's an entity framework core project which is your ORM and 
inside of here is where all of your database migrations live and that's where your data context lives. And then lastly, there's a migrator project and the migrator project is a basically a very lightweight command line tool that you can hand off to a DBA because DBAs generally don't like, well, people who are security minded generally don't like their application to have full access to the database. They don't want to, it to have access to drop tables and create new tables and do database backups and things like that. They don't want full DBO access. And so generally DBOs are going to, DBAs are going to give you access to make the changes you needed to, but just not from the application's perspective. And so that's where the migrator comes in. You can hand off the migrator command line application to a DBA, or better, you can run the results of this migrator project in a CICD pipeline. So there we go, that's the back end. And on the front end of things, okay, I'm over here in Visual Studio Code, and I have opened up the folder called Angular. And inside of here, you'll see a lot of the things you might expect to see in an Angular app, including a packages.json, which we're going to need to, we're going to need to have this thing do a, an NPM install to install all of these dependencies. That's going to take a long time, so I will do that sped up. But uh, there's also a SERS folder, which is where the vast majority of your code lives. There's an app folder, which is where the vast majority of the app lives. Outside of the app, there's things like the shared folder, which is shared uh, content, including um, like authentication and animations, I guess you'll see in some layout things. Uh, and then the vast majority of where the code lives that you're going to write in, exists inside of here. So if you write something like uh, the ability to create a new role, the ability to edit a role, or the ability to view all roles, that would all happen inside of the roles folder inside of application. Okay, so there we go. I've got an overview of the application. Let's create a new database table. The question is, what should this table be called? Now, if I go into the app settings folder inside of here, app settings.json inside of the web host project, you'll see that it's kind of expecting us to have, here's the connection string, and the connection string is expecting us to have a database called Lee's Web Store DB. There's no real reason that I need to keep that, but I don't know, out of convenience, I guess I'll just do what it suggests and create a new database called Lee's. WebStoreDB. Now, this new database, Lee's WebStoreDB, does not have any tables, you'll notice, and so we need to get some tables in there. ASP.NET Boilerplate comes with authentication and authorization, and so in order to be able for that to work, there needs to be a users table, and a roles table, and a permissions table, and a bunch of other, maybe tenants. I haven't gotten into multi-tenancy. It's one of the huge benefits of using ASP.NET Boilerplate, but all of those tables need to get created. So to do that, I can go over to the package manager console and it's important, very important to remember to set the default project, set that over to entity framework core and I'm going to call update data base. Okay, for some reason that took a little while I guess to do the initial compile. So the database migration is complete and it ran a whole bunch of migrations and if we zip on over to my database we should see, refresh, that there are, there we go, a whole bunch of database tables. There's things like languages and features and tenants and users and user logins. Okay, great. So we are probably ready to hit F5. And if I hit F5 right now, it's going to run the .web.host project. And we should be able to see our very first backend uh, code running and and that will be a should be a swagger file so if you're not familiar with swagger it is a very nice way of describing a JSON uh, API endpoints and giving you and also gives you a nice little UI to be able to execute all of the uh, endpoint update create delete get features Hey, oh, that took a little while, but there we go. First run completed, and you can see that there are things like roles, and we can be able to should be able to get all roles and execute this. We could try it out. 
um, and it takes a keyword and a skip count, max results counts, and this is what uh, an example response might look like. Very nice, but we want to actually see the website, the Angular website. So to do that, we're going to head on over into the Visual Studio Code project, and I'm going to open up a terminal, and at the terminal, I am going to make sure I'm in the Angular directory, and I'm going to try to download the internet by typing npm install, and I'm going to speed up time super fast so that you all don't need to wait for the download for the internet download to complete. Oh, it finished! Wow, all right, that's great news, and it looks like already I'm a little bit out of date and need to run some updates to get the latest stuff, but I won't worry about that for right now. The next step is to run npm start. We can either run npm start, which is going to run this script right here, ng serve, or we could just write, we just run ng serve by itself too. Uh, it's not a bad idea to install the Angular CLI, which would be like an npm install minus g at ng CLI, I think it's like that. Uh, and that gives you the ability to do things like ng serve, which is going to launch the application, or you can also do things like ng generate component, and then you can give it a my new component, and then that is going to install a new component into the current folder that you're in. But we're just going to ng serve. Oh, hey, thank goodness for post-editing, being able to speed that up. Um, there's been a lot of waiting, but trust me, it is totally worth it. When I zip on over to my website now and I type localhost 4200, which you'll notice it said was the port that it was in somewhere up here in the, ah, oh, it's not even worth it. Just trust me, it's always 4200. Over on 4200, it's going to load up our site and ho ho, I told you it was worth it. We have here ourselves a login page and the very top of this is asking us to choose a tenant and this is the multi-tenancy feature. This is wonderful if you have multiple clients that could be logging into your site and you want each of them to be able to view a different set of data. So if you're serving a store, for example, you might have, oh no, that's not a great example. Okay, there's gotta be a better example. Let's say that you have a, a, a great new feature and a service and you have a bunch of customers and each one of those customers is going to log in and see your great new service then each one of those customers gets their own data. Eh, it's not a great example. Anyway it's easy to turn off if you don't need multi-tenancy but if you do need multi-tenancy this saves an enormous amount of work. It is a fantastic uh, tool and surprisingly or not the last two times I've used ASP and Boilerplate I've taken full advantage of the multi-tenancy. Uh, so you get one tenant for free by default, and it is called default. So if I were just log in right now with a password of 123QWE, and if you're wondering where that comes from, well, it's in the documentation, but you can also type in default password over here, and this is in the core authorization users uh, user folder. You can see that the password is 123QWE. You can change that if you want to. It would probably be a good idea. And then you can log in as default. Or if you want to, you can change this to the host where you put in an empty tenant name. You can see it actually says leave it empty to switch to the host. And if you log in like that, then you get a version of the site which gives you a list of all of the tenants and you can create a new tenant. Hey, here it is. Here's the site. Now this might not be a site that you would use too much because you don't need to create tenants very often. But if you did need to go and create a new tenant, this could be customer Tim and then customer Tim. Oops, we don't even need that. Something like that. We're gonna create that customer Tim tenant. And now if I log out, I can go over to current tenant and log in as customer Tim. I could just as easily have left it as default, but you're going to see now what the multi-tenancy feature looks like a little bit. And this person now has a home page, a users, a roles, an about page, which is 
stuff you can just throw away. It shows you an example of multi-level. You can go in and get an example of what it should do for what your basic CRUD looks like. If I needed to add a new user, I could go in here and say what their username is and their password and their email and whatnot. And you can see what multi-tabs looks like. There's multi-tabs to say what user role they should belong to. If I needed to create a new role over here, such as a manager, and what permissions they have. Let's say a manager has access to neither edit users nor edit roles. And I save that and there is my manager. And if I wanted to go over to users and create a new user, I can specify information over here and you'll see that the user roles now contains the manager that we just created. So there's that. You'll notice that there is a search page up here, which for some reason didn't uh, display correctly. I've never seen that happen before, but normally it's a little white box there. You can choose the triple dots and you can choose the theme. This is on a per user basis. It's one of the benefits of ASP.NET Boilerplate, the fact that you have a whole uh, like properties uh, API where you can save things, string username values, you can save them on a per user, a per app, a per tenant, or a site-wide across everything basis. And so when the user, the current user is called admin, I guess. And when admin logs in, now his color is always going to be purple. And you'll notice that all of the buttons and everything all change to be purple as well, whatever the color uh, of the day is. And that's not like a super awesome feature, uh, but it is something that makes customers often makes them uh, smile, makes them happy to be able to customize their own version of the site. So if it's not too much effort, it might be worth uh, allowing that to stay. All right, I think we've given enough background about what ASP.NET Boilerplate is. Let's get into some of the details. So I'm gonna go back over to PowerPoint here. And I already warned you that when you're choosing your startup template, do choose carefully because if you choose .NET Core, again, no encrypted columns, you only get table per hierarchy inheritance. You don't get table per type, which if you're a DB Nazi, kind of like um, I am, then you, may not be quite exactly how you'd want it to be. I won't worry bore you with the details. There's less query optimization. For instance, Entity Framework Core only got group by. If you were group by, it was executing that in memory until Entity Framework Core 2.1. So it's just less mature. Um, I would be remiss not to mention that there is a paid version of ASP.NET Boilerplate, and that's relevant for a couple reasons. One, they're liable to be in business for a while, and indeed, they've been in business for five years. This framework is now five years. It's 2019 now, so they've been around since 2014, I believe, and I guess they make money by people paying for this uh, more attractive UI and for all of these features. So all of these features here on the Enterprise Features list are relevant for two reasons. One, you don't get these when you choose the free version, which I have been demoing to date and continue to demo. And for the second reason is that everything on here is actually got an extension point. And so it's relatively easy to write yourself if you want to. In fact, all of ASP.NET Boilerplate is super pluggable and uh, changeable. Everything is based on interfaces and modules and you can add and imp implement your own version of just about everything anywhere. So for example, the identity server integration, that's not included in the free version, but there is a very easy way to integrate with identity server if you need to. So that's kind of cool. And it costs money. Okay, there are front end features and there's quite a few of them. I'm going to kind of go over this from an Angular uh, perspective. Again, I kind of apologize, but that's what my background is. So. There's a number of things like live reloading that you may have come to expect, but it's sort of worth pointing out that they generated that Angular template from the command line that from the Angular CLI. And so it doesn't look too terribly different from what you would have gotten if you generated everything from the Angular CLI and including the live reloading feature. So that is one of those features that just, you know, little things that make me happy. Similarly, local styles, you know, that's normally part of Angular, but I just didn't want anybody thinking that ASP.NET Boilerplate goes too far off of the beaten path. It's using the default options for just about everything and the ability to have uh, SAS or less files local to each component is one of the benefits. 
I already mentioned Swagger. Swagger is a wonderful way to document your APIs. Um, but I have not mentioned NSwagger. And I'm going to get into this in a little bit more detail. But I love, 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 love this feature. This is a feature that looks at your Swagger JSON file and generates the TypeScript service proxies for accessing that in a strongly typed way in your front end. So if you define a new data transfer object called a product DTO, for example, when you run nSwagger, it will create that in TypeScript with a strongly typed set of properties for everything that you would have sent into the server. And then in addition, you get even more. You also get the ability, it also generates a service proxy. And that service proxy gives you all of the code. It looks a little bit like this. It gives you all of the code to call into the back to the back end in an observable kind of way. So it's returning observables as you would expect. It generates a ton of boilerplate code that just gets things done quickly. It's absolutely wonderful. I'll be demoing that in a little bit. Okay, localization is also built throughout. So if internationalization is important to you, one of the things you can choose is what language you want as a customer, and that is something that is stays with you, or you could write a little code to detect it, I suppose, as well. And then the vast majority of the code that has been generated for you includes code that, this is a little bit out of date, but it looks a little bit like this, with an L to localize the word title, and then, whoops, and then that goes down here to title. If you're in English, it goes to the your project.xml file and it pulls out the value here. If you're in Spanish, there's a myproject-es.xml and it pulls and it'll pull that out if the user has selected Spanish. So does that really well? That's on the both on the front end and on the back end. Very nicely done. I already talked about the multi-tenancy. That's a great feature. The permissions model is wonderful. I really love uh, if you are storing the user's roles and all that in your own database, then this is, uh, this is super powerful. Uh, if you uh, are storing it in something like Identity Server, you still can have the permissions model. And I'll get into that more into a little bit more detail. The authorization piece is the way you would expect. It uses bare auth. That's real good. Also gives you pagination and sorting. It gives you the facility to do that pretty easily without too much extra effort if you use their way of doing things. All of the front end components in Angular are based on material, Angular material. And so you get all of these nice little components like the date picker and sliders and navs and menus and toolbars and cards and, and all of these things over here that end up looking very nice. Okay, let's get to the meat of things. Let's get to the back-end features. There, I took this slide from their website, but I just kind of want to describe what it is in a little bit more detail. So when it talks about DDD base classes over here, it's talking about the application service. I guess this is a pattern. I'm not as familiar with it, but it seems to work pretty nicely. Uh, generic repositories, so for accessing, instead of having to mock out an entire context object for if you're doing unit testing, you can just pass in a single iRepository of product or, or whatever. And so this makes unit testing a lot more uh, narrow and lower level. And I like this pattern a lot. This works out very nicely instead of having a whole context available to everything. So there's declarative authorization. If you put these attributes on your method names or on your class names, here it's at the method level, but I generally put it at the class level, then this is saying that nobody is allowed to access this method here in the application service unless they have this uh, updating tasks permission. And you go and register that permission somewhere, which I'll show again later. So there's also transaction and connection management that happens automatically for you. Whoops, that happens automatically for you when you when a somebody calls into your web API. So the the everything that happens from the beginning of the application service to the end of the application service happens in a transaction and one database connection and unless you start customizing it. If you want to throw additional attributes on your subclasses, for instance, if you have multiple 
databases that you're accessing, then you might need to do this, but generally you don't need to mess with it. But you can have a uh, transaction scope. You can change the transaction scope with like a, with a transaction scope attribute. I forget exactly what it is, but you get logging. So there is a, in the base class of application service or in domain service, if you have, if you have services in your core, they're going to inherit generally from domain service. And in, in both cases, you get a logger. You can also use dependency injection and say, I want an I logger, but you get a, a method level instance one for free when you inherit from these two base classes, if you choose to. And then that hooks into, by default, and I'm sure you can change this, but by default it hooks into log for net and log for net gives you, all, it has all the methods you would expect. Okay, uh, let's see, validation. I'm gonna go into more detail on the validation on the next slide, but the validation uh, facilities are, are fantastic. So when you have something like an update task input DTO object or, or something like that, you throw on your uh, annotations, your regular string length or the required attributes, and it automatically validates those even before it gets into the application service. So that validation is absolutely wonderful. I love it. Oh, there's also auditing. I'm going to get into that in a lot more detail. So object to object mapping, it uses auto mapper by default. You don't have to use auto mapper. If that's just too much magic for you, you can do it by hand, but it's all hooked up and works pretty nicely. And I generally like to use it most of the time. If you want to, you can throw a user-friendly exception at any point in time, and that automatically returns a 500 HTTP response back to the front end. The front end catches it, double checks that it's a user-friendly exception, and if it is, then it pops it up in a nice, pretty dialog to the user. I will show that. And then mention localization already. Whoo, that was a lot. Let's get into those details a little bit further. So as far as the validation, I mentioned already that if you toss in these required or string length or integer attributes that it automatically checks those. But also, if you need to write your own code on the server side, you can implement I custom validate. And when you do that, then you get an add validation errors and you can run a bunch of code inside of add validation errors like if the due date is less than now or whatever and then you can add a validation result and when you do that on the UI it pops up with a nice little dialog that says hey you can't do that just yet because it failed a validation message. All right let's talk auditing. The auditing features are amazing. I love this so much. So if you have a, a entity, like this is a to-do, or we could call it a product or whatever, and you implement I full audited, then you are required to implement all of the uh, creation time, last modified time, creator user ID. You get the, oh, no, here it is, creator user. I guess this part might be optional. Anyway. A last modified user is deleted, deletion time, deleted user ID, deleted user. And when you implement all of those, you never need to set any of these things. This creation time, it ABP framework automatically sets creation time for you. It automatically sets last modification time and last modified by user every single time you make a change to an entity. How awesome is that? That saves you so much work. And better than that, there's also this is deleted bit. And so I have to talk about the I soft delete. So if you, if any of your entities implement I soft delete, then automatically you get, uh, it automatically sets is deleted to true. And whenever you're querying your database, then it will fail to return the object because it has a filter in the entity framework query that removes anything where is deleted equals true. So it just automatically handles it. You can treat it like you're doing a hard delete. And in fact, I can show that real quick. If we were inside of the, I don't know, we were in the role app service. And if we just wrote a little method here, there we go, repository. It's a role repository. Inside of a role repository, if we call dot delete or delete async, we should probably call delete async, right? And we want this to be a task. 
There we go. Okay, so now we have a method which is going to get the very first roll and then it's going to delete the very first roll. And that is probably not all that useful, but the thing to know anyway is that what it's actually doing behind the scenes, it's not doing a hard delete because a roll implements I soft delete trust me, it does, then it's going to just set the is deleted equal to true. And the next time you call this, it's, it's even though that same row will be in the database, it won't return from this call. So that's pretty cool. Love that feature. Uh, I, sh I should mention logging. Logging is important. And because one of the features here is that if you, if you just say int i equals five, divided by zero, that's going to, oh, it's too smart, and j equals zero. And if we say i equals five divided by j, okay, the compiler is not quite so smart now. Uh, this is going to throw a runtime error, of course. It's going to throw a divide by zero error. And if the front end calls into that, this is going to return a uh, probably like a 501 or something like that. And then that gets returned back to the client and it pops up a little error message to the customer which says an error occurred. And it shows no information about the stack trace or the details of what it is. It's just a very generic error, which is a security best practice, right? Generally, you don't want to leak information about the internals of how your app works. So, but as a developer, you need that data. The answer is that Log4Net by default is capturing all of that information and it's logging it into a folder. There we go, I eventually found it. So the location of the logs by default, this is really important, is going to be in your store and your ASP.NET Core, your source, your host folder, your app data, your logs. So don't forget that. You are going to need that information. And I like to use a tool called Beartail because it just constantly runs in the background and I can highlight any time there's an error or a log um, and I can just follow the tail and that's nice. Uh, or you can do it in PowerShell or whatever, it doesn't matter. So that's just a little, little tip that's really important. As far as deployment goes, there is a Docker file by default. And so that's really nice. If you're not familiar with Docker, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I will say this. I'll just give you a little story. And that is that the other day I was building a feature which would export to Excel. It would export, I don't know, whatever, some, some data to Excel for the user. I deployed this onto a Linux server because it was .NET Core. And on the Linux server, it turned out that it needed to have a particular package to be installed. Well, I could have just uh, telneted in, I could have uh, telneted into the, uh, the server or whatever and done an apt-get install, but that would have only fixed it for that one server. What about the UA2 server? What about the test server? What about the prod server? What about all of my other developer, fellow developers that might be running this on Linux? So. I was able instead to go into the Docker file and add that apt get install into the Docker. And then I never have to worry about any other environments. It's taken care of uh, for all future environments and it's done in source control the correct way. So that's very nice. One of the downsides, I will mention that the Docker currently doesn't use multi-stage commit, but it may by the time that you uh, may by the time that you read this because uh, a SPNet boilerplate is constantly making updates. So. And it's not hard to add multi-stage multi -stage compiles. I already mentioned the compiler or the migrator app, uh, so I won't give it any more airtime, but it's a nice feature. And as far as testing goes, the testing facilities are, are really nice. You get uh, everything as an X unit by default, so it uses facts. If you're used to N unit, it's just the same thing, except with it's, it's the fact. Um, I don't really care much the difference between X unit, N unit, and MS test. They're all kind of the same. Uh, it uses N substitute for mocking. So it's, uh, the, the syntax is like substitute dot four instead of a uh, new moke, I think is what I'm used to. I'm using, used to using mock or moke or however you pronounce that. And uh, what's really cool though, is it has this in-memory database. And so when you call using db context async, 
like this, you get a database context. And with that database context, you can add new users. And it's it's like a brand new, fresh, completely fresh database with just the, the bare essentials in it. And then every single test gets a fresh one of those. And so their harness, their test harness, spins up that in-memory database and allows you to, your test to execute on it. Uh, it's super powerful, especially if you're running complex queries in link because those queries are actually getting executed and turned into SQL and run against the database. And so that's wonderful. The downside is it's slow. It's slow once you start getting hundreds or hundreds upon hundreds of tests as I have on some of my projects, then you're gonna notice that the performance starts to suffer. And so you're gonna wanna try to stick to pure unit tests if you can. Um, I. Uh, unfortunately, I have a framework. If you want to contact, if you want to DM me, I have a, on GitHub, I have a solution for this. Um, I won't get into it now. But. Okay, how to's. So uh, I could go into this in great detail, or you could pause the slide and write all this down, but um, we could just do it. How about we just, how about we just uh, write a new product into our store? Does that sound cool? And I'm gonna zip, you know, use the magic of post editing to zip through all of the slow, boring bits. Cool? All right, let's do it. Uh, okay, and so we're back here in Visual Studio. I'm a big fan of putting things like entities inside of core. So the kind of pattern they've been going with is one folder per area or something like that. So if we're gonna have products, let's have a products folder like that and inside of there we're going to add an entity called product and generally you're going to want these to inherit from a i entity of type int you can do that if you want or if you want to save yourself a little bit of effort you can just implement from a, just an entity event and it's going to give you if I decompile source you'll notice it gives you serializable and it gives you an uh, ID field that's a, really the only things that you need to worry about it also gives you overloads of uh, equals and is transient so uh, that's really all oh okay so then we need to give it some properties so public uh, string name get and set and then maybe we'll also give it an int of quantity that's almost all you need to do to be able to expose this off to entity framework we need to take this product and go into our data context so uh, there's a Le Lee's web store DB context which exists inside of entity framework core. And so it says define a DB set for each entity of the application. Yes, yes, I will do that. Okay, so uh, to do that, we need a public DB set of type product. And then we'll call this products. The name that you hear, specify here is important. Uh, if you don't use Entity Framework regularly, you're probably not familiar with this, but this is going to be the name that it's going to give it inside of the database. So name that carefully. And that's all you need to do in order to tell Entity Framework about the existence of this thing. I'm going to compile, make sure that compiles, and then I'm going to go over to the Package Manager console, and I'm going to do an add migration called add products notice the uh, package name the default project was the entity framework core project I had that set from before so I didn't need to change it but it's an easy mistake to make it's a mistake I make all the time I forget to change that and I'm like why isn't this working you have to change the default project right up here on the top right to be entity framework core Okay, it has added a default migration, so it's worth looking over this code generated code to make sure it looks good. It's calling it on the back end products. Yes, that looks good. It's giving it a value generation strategy of identity. That means it's the ID field is going to be a one up. It's gonna auto increment it every single time. That's called a surrogate key. We like surrogate keys. That's good. It's going to use, give it a name 
of type string and a quantity of type int. That all looks good. And a primary key called PK products of ID. So that all looks great. And if we were to ever downgrade this migration, then it would drop the table products. So looks good. I suppose if we wanted to, you know, we could get a little fancy and we could try to seed this data with some kind of seed data. We could say migration builder dot SQL or dot insert data to insert some stuff. You know, it's entity framework. Okay, so now I need to run this migration to add it into the database. To do that, I do the same command I did before, which is to update database. Now it's going to detect that this new data migration exists and it's going to run it and probably I'm going to run over here to my database and expect to see that, aha, it ran this migration. Notice the date that it put in here and if I refresh the tables I should now have a DBO dot products. Very nice. There we go. With an ID, a name, and a quantity. So that looks good. Okay. Uh, I could commit this. This would probably be a good commit point, but mm, let's go just a little bit further. By the way, just a quick recap of where we were. We added into the database context products. We auto-generated, when I did the add migration, it auto-generated a snapshot in Entity Framework to so that it can make changes, uh, so it can detect changes. I added my product entity here, and this was my migration up, my migration down, and then it made a change to the designer, which I don't really know what does, tell you the truth, thing. Well, we could, let's go ahead and commit that. We'll call that a commit point. Last thing we need to do is expose those into the API. And to do that, we're going to add a new application. And so I'm going to right click on here and make a new folder called products. And let's make sure we name it the same as the other ones over here. If you wanted to, you can make an interface. That's probably the correct way to do it, but I'm going to be lazy and not do that. So just keep in mind that I'm not necessarily following best practices by not using the interface. So I'm going to call this the product app service. And if I implement this from, if I were to just implement this from application service like that, then it would give me an endpoint and any method that I wrote into here would be exposed as a method on my endpoint. If I start the name of the method with the word get, then it's going to be uh, a get. And if I name it with anything else, it's generally going to be a post. Or I can get all of my CRUD for free if instead I inherit from CRUD, no, uh, yeah, CRUD app service. And then there's about 50 different versions of the overload here. I'm going to go with an easier one, which is going to be just product and product DTO. Ah, but what's the product DTO you're asking? Well, what indeed? If we have, if we were to expose this product itself to the API, that wouldn't be the end of the world, but there's this type of attack which is known as an overposting attack which happens on the internet that you have to protect yourself from. And generally the best way to protect yourself from overposting attacks is to have a separate level of abstraction where you, if you were to add, let's say you were to add a new field onto product called like is super powerful kill the world product. Uh, or something like that, and it's a Boolean. And if you were to add that here and forget to that you're, you'd be inadvertently exposing that to the entire internet, and someone could update that in your API endpoint. If you expose it as a DTO, it's that extra level of abstraction that you have to be much more explicit about what you're exposing. Also, if I were to go in and do the I full audited here of type user, like I was telling you about earlier. Oh, okay, okay, here we go. Uh, I had to fight that a little bit. So if I implement missing members, if I were to implement I full audited at this point, and I, I probably should have done that just to show off how that works, but I didn't. In any event, if I were to implement from I full audited of user at this point, 
then I'm also exposing a user. And if I didn't have a data transfer object, if I didn't have a DTO, then I'd be inadvertently exposing this user. And that's really bad for a number of reasons. One of which is if you go into this user, the that has a whole bunch of other fields on it, including a self-referencing field. And so a user has a last modified by, which is of type user, which is self-referencing. And when you go to deserialize that in JSON, then it gets a runtime error because it's a, it's a, it detects a loop. So that's, uh, that's kind of a, pay, a pain that's bad. That's uh, a good reason why you should follow their patterns and use a data transfer object. Okay, there's my big long spiel about data transfer objects. So if I have a public class of So again, with the DTO, you can implement from I entity DTO, or just you can implement from uh, entity DTO, and it gives you all of the code for free. I am going to give it a name and a quantity, and maybe put it in a separate file called product DTO, which is inside of core here. And then I'm going to do an Auto map from. I'm going to use auto mapper. It will automatically pick up that it is supposed to be able to map from a product to a product DTO and vice versa. Well, maybe the vice versa. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see if it works. So auto map from type of product. There we go. And now back in my product app service. It's going to ask me to implement some things. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's just going to implement a, a, a constructor. And the constructor takes an I repository of type product int and then passes it into the base. And there's no more code necessary for the create, the read, the update, or the delete. And now, if I just hit F5, then the chances are very good that I'm going to get a Swagger API endpoint with a create, read, update, and delete capabilities for a product all working right out of the box and extremely customizable. So there may be faster ways to get CRUD functionality for a, a product, but keep in mind we're using Entity Framework and this is fully customizable and that's really powerful. Okay, this has loaded. We've got a Swagger file, account, configuration, and here we go, products. And we can try, I don't know if this is going to work, try it out, actually execute, because it's going to request a username and password. Well, there it gives us a curl command. That's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, trust me, it's going to work. It's going to be fantastic as soon as we get the front end for this. So now at this point, we could go in over here. And this is how I would normally do this. I would go over into the source folder and I would go into the app folder and then I would say okay I need a new folder here called products plural yeah something like that and then I might go in and open in terminal and then I would say ng oh let's actually let's commit this to source control we've got so far yeah so this was the expose products to the products API exposing expose Yep, there we go, something like that. And so then I would do ng generate component products. And you'll see that it created a products.component HTML, a spec that's tests, a TS TypeScript file, and a CSS, which I'd immediately go over and rename to less or SCSS for SAS or less, depending on which one I'm using on my product project. And you'll notice that if I go into source control, it also updated the app module TS file, which is the place where you register all of your components, and it put in the registration for that new component. So that's really nice. I'm going to immediately take all that out because I'm going to save myself some time and energy, and I'm going to copy over uh, the entire roles folder into products, all of the contents of this create, rate, update, delete, and then I'm just going to do a search and replace using Control H, Control Shift H on a PC anyway. I'm going to do a search 
and I'm going to do a replace and I'm going to make sure I look inside of the products folder like that and then I'm going to replace all instances of the word role with the word product. Okay, I'm back again. Uh, thanks to the power of post editing, I've gone in and created a product and a create product and an edit product and all of this functionality. And you might think, well, shouldn't I just be able to refresh my site and see a product on the left here? But no, to get that, we do have to do a little bit more work. There is a sidebar nav component, and in the sidebar nav component, we have all of the code for displaying menu items. And if I were to jump into the code behind, you'll notice that this is working by having this big old list of things. And so we want another thing along with users and roles. We want, I'm not going to use localization because I'm a bad person, products. And then it wants a permission. And then, so you can only view this sidebar if you have this permission. And uh, this is the icon name, and uh, I'll just leave that alone. And this is the route that we want to navigate to. And so the route that we want to navigate to is products. And that's almost going to work. I could refresh this self and watch that this is not going to show up. And the reason is because we haven't set up the permissions yet. To, se to set up the permissions, we need to have gone back into the backend application and said we want this to only be accessible if you have a particular permission which is going to look like the oops, just going to look a little bit like the one in roles so we're going to use ABP authorize and you can say you can only view anything in this app service if you have access to eh, not pages roles but this is going to be pages products create that product over here and this happens to be in a list of static names and pages dot now these things don't need to be they can type anything you want you can have you could have this be at a much lower level of detail right now I'm doing this at the level of detail of just all products in general but I could have a separate I could have a separate permission for adding, updating, and deleting if I wanted to. Or if I have a separate thing called reset quantity to 500, I could have a separate permission for that. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So I'm going to find usages on this. And you'll see over in core that this is registered. These permissions get registered, and that happens on app startup inside of the Lee's web store authorization provider. And so I'm going to register the permission pages products and we'll call this products. And there's a question as to the, the, the second parameter here is who wants this, who do we want this to be visible for? Do we want this to be visible for tenants, hosts, or hosts and tenants? Products is the kind of thing that really only tenants would ever be able to see. So I would argue that that should be tenants. And lastly, we're localizing this, but we don't really need to localize it because we can be a bad person. Oh, it needs to be localized. OK, well, I get to show you the localization. So there's an XML, Lee's web store XML over here. And we're going to add a new thing called a products. And we'll just call it products. This should work. If I control F5, this will now on app startup register a new permission called products. And again, that will only be if, if you try to access the product endpoint, the product app service, you'll only be able to do that if you have access to this permission. Admins get access to that permission by default or if, remember I created a, uh, earlier in this video, I created a role called manager and I didn't give them access to anything else. Well, I could give them access to products and I probably should, it would make sense. Okay, that started up, that's great. And back in my 
web front end, I should now be able to see users pop up, which it didn't. Let's just do a refresh. Okay, and there we are. The products tag is now visible, but if I click on it, nothing happens. And that's because we have not yet registered this route. So this route's not going anywhere. So we need to go to the app routing module. This is where all of our routes are defined. So we need to duplicate something like this. The path is going to be slash app slash products and we're going to use the products component that was the one that I copied and pasted and it let it auto import from dot products products component and the permission we only want to allow people to go to this route if they have access to the slash pages slash products and this is going to use the can activate uh, it's going to use an app route guard uh, and that you can go in and F12 into it and see what the app route guard is all about. But basically that's just limiting access uh, if the permissions is equal to pages.products in this case. And this is a linting error. I'm going to Alt Shift F and that will fix the linting error and also uh, make that look prettier, I guess. And so now if I refresh this and click on, I don't need to refresh it, it's automatically running that in the background. Oh, and now this is actually giving a bunch of errors about the product service proxy not having existed. Now that I'm finally importing this products component, and that's because I never regenerated my, uh, there is no products, uh, for instance, there's no products DTO. There should have been a products DTO, and that's if I were to go into the products component right now, you're going to see all kinds of compiler errors here about the fact that, well, it's not popping up, but there's a, trust me, there's a compiler error about there being no such thing as a product DTO. Oh, it's starting right up here. And there's no such thing as a product service proxy. To get those, I need to rerun nSwagger. And I mentioned that earlier. You can do it in uh, Node if you want to, or they give you a handy little um, CD and swag. They give you a handy little batch file that you can run inside of the n swag folder. And so if I run refresh right now, you'll notice it's just going up to the node modules and running the n swag uh, node module with a run command. And if I go back into source tree, or into Git right now, you'll see that there is service proxies folder has just lit up with a whole product service proxy and a service and a products DTO. There's a products DTO and the products DTO has, oops, there it was right at the end. The products DTO has a name and a quantity and an ID great stuff and now we're not seeing an error in our products component so that's really cool and I bet this is going to start working okay well the other the only other problem is that we definitely did not register our products component yet and so to do that you do all of the registration in app.modules.ts and there's a big old list of declarations the declarations is where you uh, declare all of your components and so we are going to need to add a the last thing we need to do is in order to have a modal dialog work we need to specify we need to register which products will be used as a modal dialog and so to do that we'll do a create products dialog component there and an edit products dialog component there under the entry components compiled successfully and here we go now we have products oh uh, the last error here is that we need to register the new service proxy that we just created and so inside of service proxy module we need to register the fact that there is an API service proxies dot products service proxy and 
Okay, look at that. We have a list of products almost. We can create a new one. New product. And look at that. We have our new product. We can edit it. We can say this is new product, bang, bang, bang. And we can go in and delete it. Because I didn't implement iSoft delete, I think that's actually going to do a hard delete. Okay, so there we are. We've done all of the uh, CRUD. Let's finish up this presentation. Okay, so here's a quick slide. You can just pause if you need to get access to this slide. If you need to update the front end, uh, I just showed, this is everything I just showed, updating nSwagger, the service proxy, the left-hand nav, updating the route, and so uh, rejoice. Excellent. So I just wanted to go over real quick, again, the final sort of list of features that I've gone over in this presentation. The fact that you get CLI-based localization, nSwagger, proxy generation, pagination, sorting, you get authentication and authorization and login, you get multi-tenancy, that's a huge feature. The in-memory database testing, I didn't show that yet, but uh, it's really nice, it's excellent. The Docker, the database migrator for the deployment side, and then on the back end you get um, the whole authorization thing, which I showed, the server-side validation with the data annotations, the custom validator, I didn't show that, the user-friendly exception, I didn't show that, but I would I would love to, I'm running out of time. The automapper piece, which there is more detail I can go into there, but I'll just leave it as it is. I mean, again, a lot of this stuff is just piecing together a bunch of components that you probably already know or probably ought to know. It's it's just piecing together all of these wonderful things. Modules, I didn't mention that, but every single project in ASP.NET Boilerplate has a is a module, and so it has startup code associated with there. And so if you need to do dependency injection, then the then that you can register on a one-by-one -one basis in the module startup code if you want to. So as far as dependency injection goes, it uses Castle Windsor, which yeah, I I prefer an inject. I don't. I mean, normally I don't just I don't even care about dependency injection, but as far as Castle Windsor goes, it's the first to register wins. So you often find yourself like trying to sneak in before the first register. If you're writing a unit test and you want to like register your own thing, you have to sneak in and and register it before it would naturally have been registered, which is just silly as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, whatever, <laughs> neither here nor there. Auditing, that whole auditing thing is phenomenal along with soft delete. The repository pattern, I like a lot. I think they've done that a really nice job with that. Transactions work beautifully and the logging is all just there and works for you. So I did this slide when I gave this presentation recently. Things you will dislike about the framework and I would feel disingenuous if I didn't at least list some of these things. Uh, such as inconsistencies in spacing and underscores and TypeScript variables. The fact that underscores exist in TypeScript variables is a bit of a travesty generally, but the fact that it's sometimes implemented and not other times implemented is is worse. There's a large global style.css, which is part of the legacy of ASP.NET Boilerplate. It didn't used to be Angular. It was kind of migrated in. Um, poorly enforced linting. The, the linting rules are, are not very well enforced uh, right now. Um, there's no front-end tests and and other things. So as far as all of that goes, uh, when I some someone took a when I slowed this showed this slide in my presentation, someone took a picture of it, and then the ASP.NET Boilerplate folks immediately responded to me and were like, "Hey, we've taken that entire slide and listed it in our things to fix for the next uh, feature," which was just it was awesome. It's wonderful. I think it shows what a great framework it is, how well it's maintained, and what how much they're listening to community feedback. It's it's wonderful, uh, and I. I I didn't want I didn't want this to come across as me griping. I just want to set expectations that if you're going to use ASP.NET Boilerplate, you are going to find things that you don't like. And if you're watching this presentation like a year from now and they've fixed all these things, you're still going to find things you don't like because that's just the nature of things. And so the reason that I'm bringing this up is because it's open source. So that's wonderful. You can contribute back to it. You can make it better. Please do. But beyond that, um, if you haven't heard of Parkinson's Law of Triviality, you totally should know about it. It is the law that says when members of an organization are giving disproportionate weight to trivial issues. In other words, if you're taking a look at the fact that something uses two spaces instead of four spaces, and you're not taking a step back and looking at how much you're getting out of this framework, you're missing the big picture. 
It's also known as bike shedding, and it's also known as don't miss the forest for the trees. This is a wonderful framework. It gives you the opportunity to be a hero on day one of your project and implement a whole bunch of best practices. It's a fantastic framework. I highly recommend it, and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. This is the end. Have a wonderful week. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to this podcast. These slides are up on that URL, and have a wonderful week. Now I've got to find the off button.